Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. In this episode, we're touching on the subject of evil. It's not really a word that we use in true crime, although it's often associated with true crime. We tend to think that we know what evil is, um, but uh, what I'm going to try and um, address in this particular episode is the nature of evil. And I'm going to do it in a very, very basic way by simply trying to explain uh, how evil comes into being. Now, in many of the um, opening and closing credits of the many episodes that I've put up so far, I think they've already been 123 or so um, on this channel, I have a slide from the Denver Post where... Nicole Kessinger says, I don't think there's a logical explanation for what he did. And I think this, in a way, addresses the problem of evil in Chris Watts, but also in general. Um, I disagree. I think, um, on the one hand, there isn't a logical explanation um, if you're using only logic. And if you're using your own logic... Um, as someone who's not a criminal and who wasn't in Chris Watts's life and who doesn't know his circumstances and who's, let's say, you're obsessed with things like narcissism and, you know, simplistic terms like monster and, and whatever. And, and if also if you've been caught up in demonizing Nicole Kissinger, then you're also not going to see a logical explanation. You might see an emotional kind of explanation. And... Where there is a logical explanation lies in the criminal psychology and what I call the symbology. Um, and I'm not going to go into the symbology here, but um, an example of that is where you experience social death and you kill someone because you, are, you feel that your social existence is being threatened. And... Um, this is very misunderstood in true crime. Um, my social existence means absolutely nothing to you, just as yours means very little to me. You know, if you've got so many followers and so much popularity in your life, um, it doesn't bother me one way or another, you know, how that's changing. Whereas how it changes for you matters a lot. And so one's social existence and the symbology around that is very very important and again you may not care about um, the social um, the social media equation of another person but your own is very very important to you J just a single notification can turn your day one way or another and so if you want to understand a criminal um, you might want to <laughs> be aware of their social um, uh, symbology and where they stand and what's going on in their social um, world uh, as opposed to just um, ignoring that and making it completely irrelevant. So, so that's certainly a um, part of the explanation. But the part that I want to deal with here in some detail is the evolution of evil. Now, the way that I guess I address evil in my books and in my um, uh, approach to criminal psychology, I don't really use the word evil. I would use the word motive um, or I would use the word, um, I guess, criminal psychology. I wouldn't really use the word evil. Um, evil is relative. Um, one person's evil is another person's good. One person's um, terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. So evil's relative. Um, s but, uh, you know, obviously we can all agree that in terms of Chris Watts, what we're talking about. Um, but in terms of motive, I think one can make the same argument in terms of evil to say that I think a lot of people imagine that Chris Watts just got up one day and murdered his whole family and that's why none of it makes sense. You sort of just see this little square and in that square is the headline and none of it makes sense. Um, 
and it's the same kind of um, very fragmented, disconnected, um, broken thinking where you would sort of imagine once upon a time there was a flower. You know, flower, w one day there was just a flower in the world. I'm, ta I'm comparing now the, the way flowers came into existence on our planet to the way that um, evil comes into existence. Um, and I think if you believe that flowers were just created, um, one day there were just flowers all over the place, um, then, then I guess that's why you don't understand how evil comes into the world. Maybe you just imagine it's also created. It's simply there. Someone put it there, and um, you know, it's it's, um, it's it's like it's almost like deterministic. Um, it's got nothing to do with people. Some outside force put it there. But there's also another way of thinking about these things, and you don't have to be an evolutionist to think that way. You don't have to believe in God or not believe in God. You can simply look at the way ordinary things evolve. For example, computers. They didn't just happen. It wasn't just one day everybody had computers. Although if you're a millennial, you can almost imagine that that's the case, that there were always computers. You could also imagine the same thing with sandwiches or t-shirts, that there were always sandwiches and t-shirts, but believe it or not, there was a time when there weren't sandwiches or t-shirts. There was also a time when the idea of a village was revolutionary, where people lived in scattered settlements, and the idea of people living together was suddenly a revolutionary idea. Even something as arbitrary as a path, a path going from one point to another, was something that um, was a step forward from people just going you know across the land on any route that they that they chose and from a path to a road and then vehicles so there's a lot of um, adaptation and upgrading in systems to get to what you eventually get and the same applies to true crime I think the world that we live in, we live in like a convenience store world where when you want something you get it. You don't know what went into making it, you don't recognize the original uh, raw materials. Even the things we eat, if it's pork, poultry, um, beef or, um, or lamb, we don't ne necessarily recognize the animals that gave rise to those tissues. Chickens, in the case of poultry cattle, cows, individual animals that amount to uh, slices of beef, um, sheep giving birth to little baby sheep and, and those are, are killed at birth and, and that's what we eat. And so it's no wonder because we live so disconnected from the natural world that we are very disconnected in our thoughts including our thoughts about evil and including our thoughts about ourselves. We take the same kind of um, quick fix approach to true crime where, we, we s where something happens, something that's shocking and inexplicable and then we immediately turn to an expert and we expect the expert to immediately give us our answers. Um, you know, why did this happen? Well, because he's an annihilator. Well, because he's a narcissist. Well, because he's a psychopath and then these labels give us what we think we n need to know about a particular set of circumstances by giving us a name we think we now have the knowledge based on that label it's almost like when you introduce to a person for the first time and they tell you their name then you feel that you know who they are or they tell you what job they do and then you feel that you know who they are basically they've given you two words their name and their job role that's really very little to go on. Before we deal with the evolution of evil in Chris Watts, I just want to play a little trick on your thinking because I'm, I'm sure you don't want to think about it in, the, in that way. So we're going to just think about a couple of things in a totally different way and then we're going to come back to Chris Watts. So if we think of something like a fire, a fire starts off in a very simple, small way. It starts off as a spark and then it grows and it's fueled and it gets bigger and bigger and there's a lot of smoke and there's a lot of heat and the fire transforms from one um, scale to another scale it consumes more and more and it 
becomes bigger and then it matures and then it stagnates and then the fire goes out and then it's over and that's the life cycle of a fire the fire evolves just as a person starts as a embryo and then a fetus in the womb and then is given birth to, to, to some kind of creature that howls all day and poops all day and can't speak and doesn't understand anything and can't even see the world to the more mature um, talking, breathing, um, procreating, eating, mobile, ambulant organism that, that we are. And then we also stagnate and become, maybe we lose our memories, maybe we lose our ability to walk. Maybe we lose our teeth and our ability to eat, and then that's the end of that cycle. When we look at fictional characters, you know, like the Joker and Darth Vader, we're very familiar with their um, character arcs. We're familiar with how they evolve into evil, evolve into darkness, how they walk the path to the dark side, right? It's a process. It doesn't just happen. It's not like one day they wake up and they're evil. It's a process. In the same way, if we look at the evolution of flight, you know, it starts off with a very rickety paper sort of contraption a um, hundred and something years ago. And then it evolves from that into something driven by propellers with two or three wings stacked on top of each other. And then, you know, maybe the millennials are born into a time when they've known airplanes their whole life. They don't even think about it. But then you have things like Boeings, and um, they're propelled by jets. And we don't even think of the aerodynamics, but all of that was something, those calculations evolved. When you look at the evolution of the, the automobile, it started when um, the, we had the year without winter. And as a result of the year without winter, hundreds of thousands of horses died all over the world. And that led to the invention of what is known as the dandy horse, which is kind of like a wooden horse. And the wooden horse um, had two wheels and kind of a saddle, which is still why the bicycle saddle is known as a saddle. It was like the, a horse's saddle. And um, that evolved into the bicycle and the bicycle evolved into like a cart and a cart evolved into a car and there were electric cars before there were gasoline driven cars and now we're back to electric cars and some of the most modern airplanes in the world are being grounded because people have forgotten in some ways how to fly and so that brings us back to Chris Watts and we say how did evil evolve in him and people want to say that he just has a disorder People want to say that he just has some kind of covert secret disorder and that's the reason why he suddenly did what he did. Really, he woke up one day and just murdered his whole family because of some little f switch in his brain. Is that why? And when you mention something like Shanann's Facebook post humiliating Chris Watts, you have an army of people very upset that you're actually linking um, something that happened in Chris's, Chris Watts's marriage to the murder. They, they're very upset that you're linking his relationship with his wife to the murder. If you look at something like an affair, does an affair just happen like a, with a, st a, 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 a snap of your finger? Is someone just suddenly in an affair one day and, 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 and then everything's going very well or do affairs also need to evolve do you also need to meet someone and be attracted to them and be more drawn to them than to your marriage and then to be in the relationship and looking back at your marriage and saying no I don't want to go back to that doesn't an affair also involve a process and doesn't an affair also evolve there are a lot of people who say that Chris Watts um, wasn't in love with Nicole Kissinger that it was just lust what about you in your relationship? Is it also just lust? What about you in whichever relationship you're in now? Is it also just lust or is it, can it also be just dismissed as um, you're a narcissist so whatever you feeling doesn't really matter? And so narcissism also evolves. We see narcissism evolving in children as they become older, as they compete with their siblings. And that's a healthy narcissism to argue about your share of the cake. 
you should be getting your equal share. And it's a healthy narcissism to say, I want my equal share. And as someone gets older and they become more sexually uh, mature, it's important that they, they care about their appearance. It's important that they respond to the appearance of others. And they then enter into that whole game of finding their place amongst the opposite sex and the opposite sex finding them and selecting them. In the interrogation of Chris Watts, that was a process as well. Chris Watts didn't just confess. The interrogators didn't just snap their fingers and say, Chris Watts, did you do this? And Chris Watts said, yes, he did, and that was the confession. It was a long process. The interrogation evolved. It evolved overnight. There were things that were explicitly evolving that were seen and, and questions that evolved and tactics that evolved. And then there were other aspects that were behind the scenes that weren't seen. When we go into things like medication, um, people, how people get addicted to pain medication, that evolves. Someone gets um, selectively numbed to the effects of certain medications. That evolves as well. There's chemical evolution and devolution. Just in the same way that food breaks down, that, that's a kind of evolution of its own kind, where the bacteria in your gut evolves as the food gets broken down. It's a period, it's, it's a process of building and breaking. If we look at something like alimony and debt, it takes time for that to accumulate. It, ta it takes time for, for, for um, obligations to mature and for them to become burdens. All of that builds and builds and builds. And if you're not going to acknowledge these equations in true crime, then it's no wonder you don't understand true crime. And this brings us to the evolution of evil in the Chris Watts case, and it's taken us 17 minutes just to basically be ready to talk about it. And so I think a very relevant question is to ask th the very simple question, why did Chris Watts kill his children? If he wanted the affair and he wanted the afterlife with his mistress, why would he need to kill his children? In, in a way one can understand there's sort of a sexual rivalry between Shanann and the mistress and maybe Shanann would have been upset and I mean even that would be unnecessary. But it seems even more inexplicable that he would kill his children. And the, the part that we're missing is that Chris Watts didn't just, uh, just think, I'm going to kill everybody. It started somewhere. I'm not going to go through the, that whole journey, but part of the journey was the pregnancy. Part of what made the affair untenable was the pregnancy. And so th his first thought was, getting rid of the child, not having the child. And he said to Shanann Watts, this isn't hearsay, this isn't in dispute, he said to Shanann, I'm scared to death having this third child. And so that's how it started. So you want to know about the nature of evil. It started with this pregnancy that first he wanted and then he didn't want it. He didn't want the child, he didn't want to be in the marriage anymore. But he didn't know how to get out of it. But that's how it started, with wanting, not wanting his child. And part of that not wanting his child comes into the, this social symbology, which is where he would have known that Kessinger wouldn't have wanted him to have a child at that time, because that would have shown her and everybody else that he couldn't just walk out on his marriage. It would have been inappropriate for her to be having a relationship with him under those circumstances. It would have been inappropriate um, for him to leave his family under those circumstances, and they both knew it. So that's where it started, with the unwanted child, the unwanted unborn child. And from there it went to, how do you get rid of the child if Shanann wants the child? Shanann wants to keep the child. There's no way you're going to get control over that equation. So what you're going to do? And we're not trying to rationalize Chris Watts. We're trying to understand the nature of evil. That's what you're trying to do. 
And so we say, how would he have reasoned through this? And so it goes from wanting to get rid of the child to probably this idea of you can get rid of the child by getting rid of Shanann, right? And so this is how the evil escalates from the child, basically from the affair to the child to Shanann. And at that point it's still just hypothetical in his mind. But then things escalate in the background, things that you don't necessarily see. Things where he will say to his wife, you know, you put a dagger between myself and my father. And you can dismiss what Nicole Kessinger says in the discovery on page 576. But she says, Chris mainly complained that Shanann would never listen to him. So if Chris Watts wants to get a divorce, will Shanann listen? If Chris Watts wants her not to have the child, will she listen? If Chris Watts wants to do anything, will, will she listen? If, if he wants to get rid of the house, will she listen? If he wants to take charge of the debt, would she listen? Equally, if Shanann said something, would he listen? Would he want to listen? And then, and this comes to the next point, the next escalational thing, is where Chris told Kessinger that Shanann would talk shit in front of him, to him, in front of his children, and the children were starting to repeat it. And I don't know about you, but, um, you know, it, it happens in families that are starting to break apart where the one parent will lambast the other parent and the children will hear it. And sometimes the parents try to recruit the children deliberately and sometimes the children are unwittingly recruited one way or another and they start um, mocking one of the parents for whatever reason, mouthing the same um, uh, accusations. If they don't want to do something or if they oppose the parent in some way, they may have the same contemptuous response but out of the, the mouths of their own children. You, you now have a disenfranchised parent hearing the evolution of this um, broken family narrative coming out of the mouth of your own child. That's another kind of evolution, right? And how does that make you feel about your family when you have your own children um, I don't want to say contaminated by the, the thoughts of one's spouse, but certainly infected in some way by, by their thoughts, by their feelings. And um, there seems to be a ring of truth in this anecdote that Kessinger relates. She said, Chris said he tried to ask Shanann for something and she, she told him to shut up and that he didn't know anything. N nothing very unusual about that. It happens in couples all the time. It happens with couples that love each other all the time. Shut up, you don't know anything. And so what happens when a four-year-old child says, shut up? What happens when a, a three-year-old says, you don't know anything? You, know, you need to eat your, your food. You need to finish your food. Shut up, you don't know anything. What happens when you come home and your children run to the other spouse for comfort and for, you know, that they rather want to be with somebody else? And, and what, had happen what happens in this situation is Chris Watts felt locked out of his own family. And part of that locking out was also him having an affair. It's not as though it wasn't his fault that that happened. But he was also not alone in that happening. It was a mutual thing. It was, it was, it was a totally mutual thing. And so Kessin just said that Chris started to repeat this and it made Chris very sad. And this is when he realized he needed to separate from her. And whether that's true or not, it certainly has the ring of truth that, that anybody would be very saddened by that and anybody would want to um, disinvest out of their family when even your own children have kind of turned against you. Maybe they haven't, but maybe it feels like they have. Again. You can look at this and be very dismissive of it because it's not you. It's not your life. It's not your children. Um, but again, I'm sure the slightest slight on social media, you're very worried about. And so I'm sure Chris Watts was very worried about this. Um, and, and so that was his emotional reality. And that is part of how the evil came into being. That was how he dealt with his emotional reality. And how you deal with your emotional reality is also your business. If 
you don't like what someone says to you on social media, you have every right to do whatever you want to. Someone else may call that evil. It's not evil, it's part of your wiring. It's part of how you deal with your emotional reality. And obviously what Chris Watts did here doesn't quite fit into that thing of relativity because no matter how you spin it, no matter who's talking about it, um, murdering your family is evil. I don't know if there's a, a, a greater evil than that. But the evil evolved and it evolved from somewhere, didn't it? When Coda interrogated Chris Watts, he said, um, you know, I want to talk to you about something that's kind of hard to talk about. And he said, you know, I need to keep an open mind, but while I'm listening to you talk about your wife and your marriage, but the day that she goes missing is the day that you guys have marital discord. And so what Code is saying there is, sorry, this doesn't make any sense. Where's the evolution behind this discord? Why is it that on the one day you have an emotional conversation, your wife walks out? Did she just snap? Or... Was, has there been emotional discord all along? And Chris Watts doesn't want to talk about the long period of emotional discord. Why not? Because that is opening the door to thoughts of premeditation. That will be opening the door in the investigator's mind to motive, to the evolution of evil, the evolution of criminal psychology. Does that make sense? In the phone data review, Shanann tells Watts, you never ever listen to me. And so whether Chris Watts didn't feel listened to, you might say Shanann did listen to him, um, but Shanann didn't feel listened to by him. And when she bought the book, he threw it away. When she wrote the love letter, he didn't respond. So there was definitely a case of people not listening to each other and not necessarily saying very nice things to each other and making accusations that the other didn't appreciate. That's how mar marriages break down. And that's the evolution of, of um, evil that one's got to acknowledge here. There was evil entering the what's marriage. And one could describe that evil as one or both people just not listening to each other. And what do you call it when someone doesn't listen? Just as a general thing. When someone is talking and someone else just doesn't listen, what do you call that? Well, one possible <laughs> description for that is contempt. You've written someone off. You've dismissed them. They mean nothing to you. They are invisible. They're non-entity. They're nobody. They're no one. And anyone who feels treated that way wants to be treated by someone else as a somebody, as a someone, as someone worth listening to. And so to come back to the evolution of evil in Chris Watts is it starts with him wanting to actually repair the marriage and Shanann wanting the same thing by having a child, that having a third child would actually bring them closer together. But neither of them, I think, took stock of where they stood with their finances no, no, neither of them really took stock of where they stood with each other, having already had two children. And Chris Watts probably didn't, um, know, didn't couldn't predict that his um, fitness and so on would activate someone at his work a in, a, in a strong way and how that would affect him. But in any event, it did affect him. He did have a change of heart that he, he felt he couldn't do anything about um, and that made him feel that he didn't want a child anymore. And how, do, how does he begin to tell his wife, who's quite a controlling, dominant force, I don't want a child anymore and I actually want a divorce. Um, and so you don't need to accept Chris Watts doing that or condemn Shanann for being the person that she was. All you've got to do is understand how this dynamic could have caused things to spiral and evolve and get worse and worse and worse. That's all you've got to do. You don't have to say anyone was right or anyone was wrong. Simply the dynamic as it was playing out. And so it went from, as I say, didn't just go from, I'm going to annihilate my whole family. It went from, I've, I'm with someone else that I love, I can't afford to have a child. How do I get rid of the child? I need to get rid of Shanann. 
and then my children have also been turned against me and you might differ from that you might say no they, they weren't but then what's your explanation for why he killed his children if Nutgate didn't happen and his own children weren't sort of part of a conflagration with his parents then what was his reason for getting rid of his children if he loved his children once upon a time and I believe he did if he loved his wife once upon a time and I believe he did what could have changed that well two things him loving somebody else and also his family seemingly not loving him and being separated from him for a while may have made it feel like that and the more people want to demonize Chris Watts and literally what that word means is turn a human being into a demon and a lot of people are doing that people are doing the same to Nicole Kessinger um, the more you wanna demonize Chris Watts the more you say well he has no emotions no heart no feelings um, he didn't feel anything for Nicole Kessinger she also used him or something I don't know there was no nothing going on in the relationship but Shanann was the perfect mother and, and, and he also had perfect children but I don't understand why this crime happened if you're going to insist on thinking like that in a fragmented way in a disconnected way then no wonder you don't understand and uh, that may be the reason you've got certain problems in your life that you don't understand at the time at the, at the moment that you start acknowledging that people on both sides of this family may have made mistakes and that they're human beings and that human beings make mistakes and they're part of a, a system and a process that can get worse and if you make the right decisions they can get better and if you recognize and adapt you can improve your situation but if you insist on labels and fragments then your problems are going to stay there and the pieces of the puzzle aren't going to come together and things are going to fall apart and evil is going to flourish but if you prepare to see that mistakes happen and that we all make mistakes then you can find a way to put pieces together again and find your way back to your bliss Thank you for listening. On Patreon is an episode dealing with um, a criminologist. So go and have a look at that. And I'll see you guys next time. We'll be back to you.